Getting ChatGPT to actually listen to you is the number one problem I hear. After helping hundreds of people, it really comes down to four common mistakes that I see. And most people think that they need to become experts at prompt engineering. That's not it. In fact, half the time it's just picking the wrong model for the job. This is something that most people never even think about. I'm gonna walk you through that model choice and the other three mistakes that are actually stopping you from getting what you want from AI. Let's get into it. Alrighty, so here are the four common mistakes that are correlated to many complaints that I hear from different individuals. So the first one here is choosing the wrong model. Like I said, we'll jump into this first. After that is saying the wrong thing to the AI, which comes down to prompting. Next is lack of context, which is not sharing the enough, enough files or the right files. And then lastly is choosing the wrong features for the wrong situation. And we'll start with model choice. Now, when I speak to people, oftentimes they complain about the AI is giving them poor quality or poor performance. And the first thing I do before I do anything else is I ask them to share their screen. After they've shared their screen and they show me an example of where the AI has gone awry, that's the easiest way to find the issue because we're talking about specifics and not vague complaints about AI just being poor. And when they share their screen, the first place I look is the top left-hand corner to see which version of ChatGPT the model they're using. I'd say probably 60 to 70% of the time, this is the model that's there. And this is the default model, which correlates to auto. The issue with this is what we're doing is you're outsourcing the level of intelligence to OpenAI and whatever they feel is suitable for your specific situation. And that's okay sometimes, but oftentimes what people want, especially when they're working on higher stakes tasks, is they want to use a model that has higher intelligence so they have a higher chance of getting a higher quality output from that complex task. And let me simply show you what this looks like in ChatGPT. So I've just opened ChatGPT, and in the upper left-hand corner, you can see it says ChatGPT 5. Nothing is after it. If you open this up, you know you're on auto when nothing is after ChatGPT 5. If you select any other option, there's going to be something after it. So if I select instant, it says ChatGPT 5 instant. If I select thinking, same thing. It says thinking afterwards. And you have pro and it has the pro. So if you have access to pro, you're paying $200 a month and you'd have access to this option. And or if you have the business account, I think you have uh, an option to use pro as well in a limited way. Now, the question is, when do we know when to choose what model? I think it's pretty simple if you just think about it in this way. First, starting with auto. So with auto, these are going to be the everyday tasks, it's things that you do day in and day out that are likely not repetitive and or if they are repetitive, they're very simple tasks that and almost any AI can do. And by doing this, you're going to outsource the reasoning choice to OpenAI. OpenAI is going to look at your prompt, they're gonna look at the context associated to the prompt, and they're then going to decide on how much reasoning is needed for your task. So you can use this, I would say, most of the time, so maybe 60 to 70% of the time, you can use this specific model. Next, we have instant. So this is gonna be used very little. So I'd say this is probably gonna be five to 10% of the time. And this is going to be when you're in a time crunch. So you need a quick response immediately. Think if you're walking into a meeting and you need a quick fact, or you're actively in a meeting and you want to understand something quickly in between talking points that you're stating and or listening to somebody else. So these are quick facts that you're trying to get from the AI. And next we have thinking. And this is where you're going to get most of the quality output for the high stakes tasks that you have for the AI. Reason being is you're selectively choosing how much reasoning goes into the task you've given to the AI. And quickly, let's jump back to ChatGPT because when you select thinking, when I go here and select thinking, you'll see a blue box pops up here in the chat, which means I have different levels of thinking or reasoning I can attach to the model. So if you have access to Pro, you have four options. If you have access to Plus, which most people will, you'll have two options, which is standard and extended. Most of the time, you probably can just go with extended to get the most out of the AI. So that's saying, I want you to extend the amount of reasoning that you give to this task. And then finally, we have Pro. So like I said, if you have business, the business account and or the Pro account, you'll have access to this model. I often never use this. I use it sometimes, but very rarely. So this is probably one to 2% of the time. Reason being is the wait time is really long. It's probably eight to 10 minutes. And it's often not worth it because I've done tons of A-B testing between thinking and pro. And when I do A-B testing between the two, thinking either performs as well or sometimes outperforms pro on that task. Reason being is that pro is dedicated to very, very complex tasks. There has to be tons of reasoning and it has to likely be a high-end research-oriented task that maybe is very, very specific niche in biopharma or physics or something like that. That's where it performs well compared to the other models. But most of us in business, we're not worrying about that kind of thing. So we're gonna get most of what we need from thinking instead of pro. We don't have to wait as long as we have to wait for pro to perform that response. Now that's the first issue, model choice. The next one that goes on to saying the right thing at the right time to the AI, which comes down to prompting. 
So a quick shout out to a previous video I made that talks about how you don't necessarily have to be a prompt engineer. You can use AI to assist in that process. I won't dive deep on that now, so that's why I'm calling this video out so you can reference it. Hey there, quick pause in your regular programming. This video is brought to you by me. Two quick things. First, Blow is a 30-day AI insight series, completely free. You'll get 30 insights in your inbox of how you can apply AI to your business and your work. The second thing is if you'd like to work with me, Blow are a series of offerings to see if there's a good fit between the two of us. With that being said, let's dive back into the video. But a quick TLDR on that process, is what you can do is you can outsource it to AI. You can simply give AI your idea, you can run that through a prompt generator, and then out pops a pr improved prompt. So both Anthropic and OpenAI both provide prompt generators that improve your prompt for you. And to mitigate some of the people below in the comments, I know you have to give a prompt up front, so you have to have some sort of prompting knowledge. So I wanna give you three simple questions that anybody should answer when giving a prompt to an AI to then improve on. And the three questions you wanna answer is what, why, and how. So for your prompt, you want to explicitly state what are you trying to achieve in the prompt? You need to be very clear on the goal. After that, you want to state why are you trying to achieve it? By giving the end goal, the end state of what you're trying to achieve and why that's happening and the intent in the first place, that's going to give additional context for the AI. And then third is how do you want it done? So the level of constraints that you set here can vary. You can give tons of constraints because you maybe have a very specific process you want the AI to follow and a very specific output format you want from it. Or you can have minimal constraints. Maybe you just have a very specific writing style you prefer, like fifth grade reading level or short sentences. The constraint level can vary on a spectrum. So these are the three things we want to answer. What, why, and how. If you do this within your prompt, you're likely going to get a much higher quality response back from the AI. And one thing I'll end on is that this process is iterative, and it's okay for it to be iterative. So if you've given a prompt to the AI and it's given you back a pull response, instead of you immediately trying to fix that error, and saying, oh, change this, change that, you should scroll back up to the top of your conversation within ChatGPT and ask yourself, what's the root cause? What did I insert into this initial prompt for the AI to then go the wrong direction? Either what did I give it that was wrong or what did I forget to give it that's missing? And by going up and scrolling up and fixing your initial prompt, you're going to build a stronger AI intuition over time. So don't be afraid to iterate with the AI back and forth over and over to figure out the areas that you're missing and or you've incorrectly stated through trial and error with AI. And now we're going to move on to the lack of context, which is very similar to saying the wrong thing to the AI, but from a different angle. So when you're saying something wrong to the AI in the prompting situation, you're explicitly stating something in your prompt. When it comes to the lack of context, this often means you've forgotten to provide a file for the AI to reference. And a common complaint I hear around this is maybe the AI isn't following the format that you expect for what you want from the AI for the report. And it, that's probably happening because you didn't provide that context for it. So the bad path is you just give a prompt, you ask the AI, and you get a poor output. A better stru structure to this and a better output means you give a prompt, you give it context, so you've dropped in a series of files either in an ad hoc conversation or in a reoccurring project or GPT. You've then asked it a question to the AI with these two pieces of um, elements of data, and you're likely going to get a better output that follows the format that you expect. And I'll show you two common examples that I run into time and time again. So the first one here is reoccurring reports, like I said previously. So maybe you have a reoccurring report that you want the AI to write on your behalf. And that report has a very specific format. What you need to do is you need to provide a diverse set of samples to the AI, either in its knowledge base within a GPT project or a custom GPT, or drop it in, in an ad hoc conversation with it so it can reference that. And this is key because we need to show the AI what good looks like. And if we give it a few examples that, I, that are diverse in nature, we're likely going to get an output that's consistently high quality for the type of reports that we want. And the term here in AI speak is called few shot learning. So we're giving it a few shots to learn exactly what it needs to do in sampling so it can then follow that inspiration to create the same thing. The second issue I see oftentimes is you provide too much context to the AI. And providing too much context, either too many files or too many irrelevant files or too many large files, you're going to bloat the context. So this is another term that people like to use in AI is bloated context. So with bloated context, you're going to degrade the intelligence of the AI. So say this axis here, this is intelligence and this is context, how much context you've given it, I mean, how many files. The intelligence is going to drop like a rock if you give it too many files. So in this case, if you have to give a large file to an AI, and when you give that large file to an AI, you want to be explicit around where it should focus its attention. So if you give it a couple hundred pages in a PDF and say, I want you to do an assessment on this. When you say do an assessment, you say, I want you to focus your attention on very specific parts of this file 
based off of my context. So you can say, I'm a, I'm a business that focuses in this area. I only care about these segments of the PDF for these reasons. Then I want you to do an analysis on that for this specific goal. By doing that, you're focusing its attention and you're allowing it to skip over parts of the PDF that are irrelevant. That's lack of context. Now let's go into the wrong features. So a quick shout out for another video that I've made. There's tons of features within ChatGPT. I made a video that gives you a quick guide on the ones that truly matter. So you can check that out here. But the common complaints that I wanna call out in this specific video, and the first complaint is that it's making things up. And this is really a complaint around hallucinations. Say you've given a ask to an AI, it goes off and gives you back some facts, but those facts are hallucinations. The big issue this is happening is usually people are not turning on the right features and or prompting the right way. So to fix this, what we need to do is we need to ground the AI with citations. And there's an explicit way we can do this and an implicit way we can do this. The explicit way is simply turning on a toggle called web search. When you turn the toggle on for web search, the AI is going to go to the internet, grab citations, and when it provides you back information, it's likely going to have more citations than none. And then another way we can push this even further is and toggle the web search on and in our prompt, we can explicitly state that if you provide any facts back to me, there has to be a citation for every single fact. And if there are specific sources that we care about, we can explicitly state that. We can say we cared a lot about government sources, we care a lot about research institution sources, or something like that. So we can have the AI weight those sources over other sources such as social media. And to quickly show you what this looks like, we'll go back to ChatGPT. If I go to the plus sign here under more, there's the option here called web search. So when I select this, you can see that it turned on this little search blue bar. And that's going to ensure that we have citations associated to the responses we get back. The next complaint I get where there's a lack of understanding of features is that it keeps rewriting everything. So when the AI has written you something, so it's written you an email or a blog or a report, you say, hey, I want you to change the third paragraph. When you ask it to change the third paragraph, it'll do so, but it'll likely rewrite the entirety of the piece, including that third paragraph. So it's hard for you to understand what's actually changed. You have to re-review the entire thing to trust that the AI did what it said it did. This is bad for two reasons. One is it takes you a lot of time and it's a waste of, waste of your time. But also when the AI rewrites the entire thing, it's filling up its context again with irrelevant data because it's rewriting the same stuff over and over. And the way we can fix this is by using the Canvas feature. And with the Canvas feature inside of ChatGPT, it allows us to target what we want to be changed, either in code or in text. Below here is a screenshot of what the Canvas feature looks like. And what I'm gonna do is instead of showing you a screenshot, I'm just gonna show you what it looks like for real. So here we have ChatGPT. I've given it a link to a PowerPoint. So this PowerPoint is just a state of the eye report. And I wanted to see if it could read it. It said it could, which is great. So then after I could see that it could read it, I wanted to say, okay, can you summarize this into a one pager written at a fifth grade reading level using short sentences? Based off of this ask, when I gave this ask to it, I ensured that the Canvas feature was turned on. So you can see the bottom here, it says Canvas in blue. So let me go here so it's easier to see. So when you go to plus, you go to more, you can see there's an option down here called Canvas. So when you select this, you're explicitly stating that the AI has to use this feature when it responds to you. And when it uses that feature, it's going to have a pop out like this on the right hand side, which is the Canvas. And this is the one pager it wrote for me. Now there's a lot you can do with the Canvas feature, but the one thing I wanna call out here is the targeted changes. So if there's a targeted change we wanted to make, for instance, on this one, we can select this and we can say, ask ChatGPT. When we ask it a question, we can ask it either a question about the text and or we can have it change that very specific piece of text. So what I've stated here is I've asked it to change the macro point to something more subtle. So if I select send on this, the AI is gonna know I selected this text and it's going to only change that specific part of the text. And the final complaint in the feature section I wanna call out is the usage of memory versus GPT projects and GPTs. So this falls under the complaint of, I keep asking the same things over and over. And oftentimes ChatGPT will remember certain preferences that you have without you having to do anything. It happens in the background. And this is called a memory feature. This is very useful, but it's useful for a very specific use case, such as broad cross conversational preferences, meaning that you have specific food allergies, or you have a location that you live in, or something that's relevant for multiple conversations across multiple contexts. This is a broad memory feature. But if you have a very specific task, something that's repetitive, that needs to be hyper constrained to your preferences, so it outputs in a very specific way, such as writing reports or analysis, you need to use custom GPTs and or projects. Those features are dedicated to that task. Don't use the memory feature for that. And the reason we want to use GPTs and projects for those more constrained tasks, such as writing reports or data analysis, is they have specific features built in for storing system prompts, as well as files in the knowledge base for the AI to follow those instructions more effectively. And as a recap, here are the four ways that we can get ChatGPT to follow exactly what we want it to do. So the first one here 
is simply choosing the right model for the job. Next is being clear in our prompts and stating what we want from it. And a small mental trick that I found that works for others is when you're prompting AI, treat it as you're onboarding a new employee. Think about all the context they would need, give that context to the AI. Next is provide the right context. So if you're giving files to it, you should make sure you're referencing the right files, not giving it too much, and you're giving it the relevant things that are needed. And then finally, you need to use the right features for the right situation. And that's it. So if you enjoyed this, please reshare it with your friends. And as I mentioned previously, two things. First thing, below is a link to a free 30-day AI Insight series, completely free. Check it out, you'll get insights in your inbox of how you can apply AI to your business and your work. And the second thing is if you'd like to work with me, I have a series of offerings below to see if there's a good fit between the two of us. With that being said, you should totally check out the next video here that the YouTube gods thinks that you'll love. I'll see you next time.